Beliefs in witches, demons, and magical healing are not simply vestiges of a pre-modern world, static and timeless, handed down, unchanged from generation to generation. They have unique cultures and history that change over time, but they also have common traits across eras and geography. Almost anyone who lived through the 1980s in the United States, for example, will remember the nationwide obsession with alleged satanic cults of ritual child abusers. These kinds of accusations generally flared up in close relationships among families and caregivers and neighbors. The allegations carried more than a whiff of not just interpersonal conflict, but also cultural malaise and anxiety. In the same way, post-World War II German fantasies about witchcraft can help us understand the society in which they festered. Why did fears of covert malevolence, spiritual damage, and the possibility of cosmic punishment erupt when they did? What should we make of the fact that certain kinds of evil appeared to gain traction after Nazism? Well, hello there. My welcome to the Co Confronting History uh, webinar, George L. Mossy program webinar in history. My name is James Ungarianu, and today I'm very happy to have on the show Professor Monica Black from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Her most recent book, from which I just read, A Demon Haunted Land, Witches, Wonder Doctors, and Ghosts of the Past and Post-World War II Germany, published in 2020 by Metropolitan Books. The book has already been published in Dutch, and there are Brazilian, German, Polish, and Russian uh, editions in the works. Professor Black also serves as editor of Central European History Journal. Her first book, Death in Berlin, published in 2010, looked at the way people in Germany thought about death and the afterlife in the aftermath of World War I. So lots of connected themes here. Uh, welcome, Professor Black. How are things going? How was the end of your semester there? <laughs> well, thank you so much, James. I'm very happy to hear, be here today to have this chance to talk with you about the book and other things, I hope. Um, well, I think it was, you know, my semester was probably like a lot of people's this year. Um, I'm very happy that Zoom is over, or that, sorry, I'm very happy that <laughs> here we sit on Zoom and I'm saying, that yeah. I, you know, glad that Zoom is over, but I, I will be, gl I will be glad to get back into the classroom. I have to say, um, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, can you begin by telling us a little bit about yourself, your background, uh, how, and why did you become a professor? Sure, I'm not sure I have a great story about this. I mean, I think some some people have had a much more, um, how should I say it, d a direction direction filled life that I've had in many ways. And, you know, when I was young, I, I was, I was a very curious person. I still am that way. And I was curious about everything. And it took me a really long time to finish my bachelor's degree at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, a really long time. And partly that was because I was so busy taking all sorts of classes that I didn't mm -hmm. need to take. But, you know, I just, I took a long time. So when yeah. I finally got towards the end, by that time, I had gotten acquainted with a couple of professors who really, really had a very profound impact on me um, mm -hmm. as, a, as a person who likes to think about the world and why things are the way they are. And I started thinking, well, I, I'd like to do something like what they do. I'd like to read books for a living. that will be great. Yeah, I like reading. Um, and so I decided to go to graduate school, but even on the eve of applying for graduate school, I was still thinking, hmm, do I wanna be a historian? Do I wanna be an anthropologist? Do I want to study literature? You know, I couldn't, I couldn't really decide. So, because I just had a lot of interests. In the end, I decided on history and I've always been happy to, to be a historian, um, but I, I guess it could have gone a number of different ways. And the fact that I'm a kind of anthropologically minded historian probably has a lot to do with that. You know, that actually sounds pretty straightforward. I, I know a lot of academics who uh, kind of fall, fell into academia and the professorship by accident. I, my, myself, I, I started as an architectural drafter and I had no idea at that time that I wanted to become a historian of science and religion. So uh, we, we, we get into our careers in, in very different ways. So having, having said that, are there any particular, is there a particular book or books that were sort of formative for you when you were a student? 
Oh, sh yeah, sure, surely there are. I mean, I was always, um, although not all of them are history books, that's for sure. Um, I was always very interested in um, the sort of British tradition of social anthropology, people like Mary Douglas and Evans Pritchard and people like that, who just made you think about questions that you had never thought about before, made you think about um, categories of things that you had not really, categories that you hadn't really questioned what exactly they're meant to define about the world and how we understand it. And that was just mind blowing to me. I was also always really, um, really interested in, in historians, particularly early modern historians of Europe, like Natalie Davis, who's my hero, and Carlo Ginsberg, and scholars of that kind who take a kind of a small slice of a thing and then blow this thing up into um, a, a, provide a framework for understanding extremely big questions. So I was always very influenced by, by those scholars, by early modernists, by, by Davis and, and Ginsburg. Um, and to be honest, I'm really influenced by, by novels and by literature. I mean, if you think about, you know, a book like The Trial by Franz mm -hmm. Kafka, I mean, talk about a mood. How do you make a mood like that? How do you, how do you with words, create that level of anxiety in a reader? It's incredible. It's, a, it's just to say that it's art is ridiculous. Of course it is, but that is an incredible feat um, of almost magic. And so I've been, you know, I've always been amazed by um, fiction writing and uh, I'm sure that in some way as a kind of um, never tried but failed novelist, I, uh, I'm sure that's affected the way that I think about writing history in some ways. No, I, I can definitely see that in, in your book. Uh, it's, a, it's a really fascinating and engaging story. Um, and thank you for sharing that. So your book, uh, A Demon Haunted Land, the title is very interesting. Is there any connection with the Israeli journalist uh, Amos Ellen's uh, journey through a haunted land? I'm also thinking of uh, perhaps maybe science popularizer, Carl Sagan's A Demon Haunted World. Is any any connection between that? So the Elon book for sure I had read and it's, and I, I quoted in the book at a certain point, he, you know, that's an amazing book. And I think um, one of those kind of travel logs where the, the, the person coming from outside can see all kinds of things that the people who are in the midst of the thing cannot see. And so that was a very, I thought that was an amazing book. And, and I'm sure that in somewhere in the back of my mind, it was there. The Sagan book, I didn't find out about it until after I had finished this book and, and had decided, and we had decided on the title. Um, though I was a great Sagan fan as a, as a middle schooler in North Carolina um, and never missed his show. So in a way, I guess it could yeah. be a kind of homage to him, but, but it wasn't intended that way. Yeah, I wonder if, I wonder if Sagan was influenced by, uh, by Amos and his, and his book. But, um, so interesting stuff, uh, you, you, yeah. begin, you begin your book by sort of setting the scene, right? Uh, after Hitler and the denazification of Germany, where the Allies undertook sort of this massive public purge campaign of, of purging everything that symbolized the Third, third Reich. Uh, there, there's, there's a lot of guilt. You know, there's, there's a lot of pain. Um, so much psychological punishment imposed and self-imposed on the German people after 1945. Can you give us a sense of that, that unrest, of that, that resentment that occurred after 1945? Well, one of, that's one of the things that I tr I'm trying to get at in the book exactly is, the, is, this, um, is this, if you will, a, a sense of the sort of psychological and emotional landscape of post of immediate post-war Germany. And I should be clear about, about when, I, when I write about guilt in the book, what kinds of things I mean. So for example, it's not at all clear that Germans felt guilty about what we would now call the events that we would now call the Holocaust. That's not clear at all. It's clear that, that, that something like, that there was a culture of shame in post-war Germany, which I don't think is the same thing. Okay. And I think that um, a lot of Germans were, as you say, as you said a moment ago, extremely resentful mm -hmm. about having um, a group of powerful outsiders come in 
and their erstwhile enemies, I should also underline that, their erstwhile mm -hmm. enemies come in and take over their country and begin the process of trying to dismantle Nazism across a huge spectrum of different sorts of, you know, everything from chipping swastikas out of gravestones and taking yeah. signs, street signs down from the street called Adolf Hitler Street to um, having influence over the kinds of books that school children were gonna be reading and purging um, doctors who had been heavily involved in the eugenic um, practices of the Third Reich. I mean, there's just, denazification implies a whole lot of different things. And there was tremendous resentment about it, um, not least because a lot of Germans felt um, that in many cases, the big fry, the people who had been most responsible, got away clean and people who had been much less responsible for what had happened were held, were often held to account. Um, and I think one of the things that I try, one of the things that my book is trying to do is give, is to give readers a sense of what, when I say the emotional and psychological landscape, what I mean is how Germans, how people in Germany related to each other in this kind of post-apocalyptic landscape after the war, how their fears of being, um, of having their past exposed to okay. in public, how that uh, influenced the way that they related to one another. Um, so it's a lot of different things. Um, and also the sort of, a sort of an, an inchoate anger about what had happened, that, that Germany had lost um, this incredibly long, arduous, incredibly violent war. Mm -hmm. And who was to blame for this? Who was to blame for this loss? Um, and what did it mean to sort of think about, uh, you know, who was the author of this massive failure? And how, how does one explain that to oneself? How does one explain to oneself that, you know, your, your son has been killed in a war for, for, for a reason that no one can put their finger on anymore or that your father is dead or that half your family is dead because they were, you know, because a bomb fell on your apartment building. And no one, it seems to me, had a very good answer for why that had happened. And that too, thinking about failure and the meaning of failure was, is a part of that sort of, again, landscape that I was trying to describe. Yeah, you give a really intense uh, sense of what you call apocalypse, apocalypticism, right? And, and just kind of this dread of the end. Was, was this a particular religious response or religious phenomenon, or do you see it across, across the board when it comes to how the German people responded after 1945? I think there was a lot of apocalyptic thinking and um, in Germany after the Second World War. There was a lot of apocalyptic thinking in Germany before the Second World War. I mean, apocalypticism is a kind of thread that you can, that you can trace from the First World War through the Second World War and after. Yeah. Yeah. So there's that on the one hand. Um, but it, does, it did seem to me that in reading the sources that apocalypticism after the Second World War often focused on certain kinds of things that I found really interesting because as I try to, as I try to underline in the book, um, thinking about phenomena like apocalyptic thinking is or should be treated extremely contextually. So when people say, oh, apocalypticism, people think of ap apocalyptically, that happens everywhere all the time. First of all, it doesn't happen everywhere all the time, but I also think that it has a very particular meaning in the place in which it erupts. And that's what I'm trying to show in the book. So the apocalypticism in Germany after the war was sometimes religious in a broad sense. It had to do with punishment and fears of punishment, maybe divine punishment. It had to do with fears about another war. This is still, even in the, in the United States too, there was still a strong feeling into the early 1950s that the possibility of another cataclysmic war was actually in the offing and Germans felt that too. And they worried about what it meant that there could be another war. And, but they also worried about things like punishment and sin. And they worried about um, 
things like innocence and guilt. And I found that very interesting in an environment in which the allies were telling Germans, you are, you, these crimes were committed in, in your name, right? The idea of what was referred to as collective guilt, mm. that somehow all the people in Germany were equally responsible, if not equally, that's not right, not equally responsible, but in some sense, these, the crimes of the Nazis had been, had been committed in the name of the German people. And so there's this sort of sense of um, that the nation was being blamed. And I found it very interesting that people would talk about sin and judgment and punishment precisely in this moment when the allies are, are charging Germans with collective guilt. Although it, that's an argument among historians about whether or not Germans were actually charged with collective guilt or if that's actually an invention of Germans themselves. That's, that's no. all, I, won't, I won't bore you with all the details of that very interesting debate. Sure, maybe we'll get into it later, but no. Okay. Um, so you, you, you argue that the G German societies suppressed these, these mem the memories of the genocide and by in this suppression, they, it sort of transformed into almost kind of en enigmatic forms of religiosity. Can you can you explain that a little bit more for us? What 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 exactly is going on there? I wouldn't say that people suppressed memories of the genocide. I what I say in the book is that there was a great deal of silence about what had happened, and that is something that we can see, you know, throughout the. The, the end of the 1940s and throughout the 50s. And even depending on generations, that silence went on for a very long time indeed. Um, so it's not about suppression exactly. It's more about people, there were, there were particular ways in which people talked about the recent past. There were very careful, um, circumspect ways in which people talked about the recent past. They only talked about it in certain terms, publicly at least. And um, I think one of the, the, I don't think it's so much that people, that almost makes it sound like a hydraulic, you know, uh, uh, like an engine or something. You put an input here and something else comes out there. I, I wouldn't, I don't quite see it that way. I don't see it as, you know, there's a suppression of a certain kind of conversation. And then that sort of, you know, tra is transmogrified into, a, into certain kinds of religiosity. What I think is that these forms of religiosity, which had existed in Germany before, as they exist in other places, um, it's when you start looking at those sources, at the sources where people are talking about apocalypticism, where people are talking about um, fears of the end of time, where people are talking about experiences they had encountering, you know, apparitions of the Virgin Mary. It's in those moments that all kinds of things get discussed, which, in in generally speaking, were were not discussed. So hmm. what I did was, in the when, what I tried to do in the book was to look at these kind of phenomena that I think a lot of historians might treat as, treat as kind of fringe phenomena, might treat as sort of you know marginal phenomena. Yeah. I took them very seriously, and I said, what can we by looking at these things and by hearing how people spoke about them, what can we learn? And I learned a lot. That's what I would say. Yeah, I mean, that, that's actually really the next question I had about, you know, there's this wave of clairvoyants and palm readers and numerologists that allegedly appear, this new wave and after 1949. But the thing that I had in my mind is, it, are the, have those things always been there? And, and scholars are now just starting to pay attention to that phenomenon as, in, in a way as a reaction against the secularization thesis, the idea that, you know, as, as modernity moves forward, you know, these things disappear. But it, in this case, it hasn't disappeared, it's there. So as you, as you just said, you know, it's, it's not just a new wave, it's always, it's always been there, right? And it's, we're now, we're now paying, we're paying attention to it more. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think these kinds of, um, these forms of religiosity, um, or these forms of sort of spiritual engagement are, 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 are as much a part of modernity as anything else. Um, I think that a lot of historians have, you know, hopefully by now are, are disenchanted with the disenchantment thesis. And I think, you know, um, and I think that um, secularism or the idea that modernity is inherently secular is obviously not, obviously doesn't really make sense. 
not even for the handful of societies for which it allegedly does make sense. I mean, secularism in terms of the way that governments are organized or states are organized is one thing, but how people think, how they feel, how they relate to each other and to the cosmos, that's a totally different story. So yes, I was sort of, um, I do think that, that the kinds of things I was looking at in this book, again, were not things that I think would interest most historians on their face, but, um, but I found them very, very, very revealing. And I think as a historian in general, I take the, I take the sort of um, counsel, I guess is one way of putting it, that um, whatever people are not looking at is the thing that you should probably be looking at because yeah. there's, there's something there that is, you know, has escaped everyone's attention. And so I, I'm always looking for weird things that yeah. are anomalous because I think anomalies are really, really interesting. Yeah, and in, in, this, in this context, you mentioned the work uh, of someone named Alfred Deek. I think I'm mm -hmm. pronouncing that right. Uh, tell us a bit about his work and, and how it helps us understand what was happening in Germany after, after the war. Who was Alfred Deek? Yeah, Alfred Deek was just amazing. I mean, I have to say that I, 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 I got acquainted with some real characters writing this book, and Alfred Deek was definitely one of them. And I actually want to write something longer about him because I think he's, he's just fascinating human being. So Alfred Deek was a kind of a failed academic in a way. I mean, he, he was working as, I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly the right details now, but he was working on a PhD and then he got drafted and he was injured. I don't know exactly know how, when he came back, he, his dissertation couldn't be found. I don't really know what that means. I think in Germany, after the Second World War, there were probably a lot of dissertations that couldn't be found. So that's kind of interesting, you know. Um, did it go missing or did it disappear, you know, because it, it was somewhere that was bombed out? I mean, who knows? There could be a number of answers to that question. So in any case, Deke was kind of a much more of a jack of all trades sort of academic than we tend to be now, where we're very narrowly for, focused. He was interested in a lot of different things. And one of the things he was interested in was rumors and the way that rumors are spread through mass media. And so he was, he noticed, he lived um, in the city of Göttingen, which is a university, a very venerable old university city in Germany uh, and, or town I should say. And he began to notice that he was hearing a lot of rumors about the end of the world that the end of the world was coming, not just the end of the world was coming, the end of the world was coming and it was gonna happen on a particular day and people were preparing for this end of the world. And what would happen, that he, which he shows very masterfully in this interesting article that he wrote was how someone, he would overhear a conversation or once people learned that he was doing this work, people started feeding him information. So I heard somebody at the bus stop talking about the end of the world that it's coming on March 17th and these rumors would then wind up in newspapers, in not just in local newspapers, they were appearing in national newspapers. And usually the, the journalist who was sort of writing about the rumors was poking fun at the people who were rumor mongering. And so the rumors that appear in the newspapers would appear in a slightly different form than they had appeared when people were talking about them on the street. And then people read about them in the newspapers, but like a lot of people now, just the same. They didn't really pay attention to the details. And so they are quoting these newspaper rumors back on the street as fact. And so Deke was really fascinated by this sort of spiraling um, obsession that the end of the world was coming on March 17th, 1949. And, and that's what he wrote about. And that, and I found that really fascinating. And then, you know, he himself was not particularly interested in the content of the rumors. That's what I was interested in. What, why did people think the end of the world was coming? And so that was, you know, he became a source for me in that way. But he's also an interesting person because, because he ignored the content of the rumors. He was only interested in the rumors and their sort of replication. He wasn't interested in what people were saying about how the world was going to be destroyed in a planet smothering snow and mm -hmm. only the innocent children would survive. Really interesting things like that. So, yeah. That's Alfred Deke. He's quite a character. Okay. Uh, so in, in this context, in, 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 your, in your story, you introduce readers to another very 
curious character, Bruno <laughs> Gerning, Gerning uh -huh. Good. Uh, the so-called yeah. miracle worker who was sort of obsessed with kind of evil spiritual things. Tell us about, about Gerning, because he plays a huge role in, in your narrative. His background, what did he do, and, and why is he important to your story? Oh my gosh, Bruno Gerning, what an amazing character. Um, Bruno Gröning was um, born in the first decade of the 20th century, and he was uh, um, he was from a suburb of the formerly German, German city of Danzig, which is now Gdansk in Poland. Um, he, at an early age, realized that he had some kind of gift that he could, his brother said once, he could heal a toothache by standing near the person with the toothache. And he had this kind of ability to um, convey healing energies on other people. And after the war, he's asked by a family who had heard about him. So at this point, he's not famous. He's just sort of a, just sort of a local guy. The family hear about him and their son, they have a little son who's nine years old, who's become, because of a kind of progressive muscular um, disorder, he's become uh, unable to walk on or even stand on his own anymore. And so he's been in bed for weeks and weeks and weeks. And the family hear about Groening and they say, you know, somebody asks him, will you come and see our son? And so he comes and pretty soon he's taken up residence with his family. And the son seems at first to be cured. The parents are convinced that he's cured and he's suddenly walking around and he's going downstairs and playing outside. And uh, later it turns out that he was not getting better, but for a moment it did seem that he was. In the meantime, people begin to hear about this incredible story and they begin to flood into this little town called Herford in Western Germany. And thousands and thousands of people are coming. And over time, these crowds grow and Groening himself moves on because the you know, he'll, he goes to, to he, he winds up in a locality and then um, the sort of town fathers in this case decide he can't do what he's doing there. And so he leaves and goes to another place. And eventually he winds up in Munich and a nearby town called Rosenheim. And in Rosenheim, he reaches the real peak of his fame. He just becomes, I mean, tens of thousands of people a day are coming to see him. And he's being written about in every major news magazine and he's, you know, um, people are making documentary films about him and celebrities are befriending him and he becomes this amazingly famous guy. And I was just fascinated by this story, not so much by Groening himself, although he's very interesting, there's no doubt about that. Um, but I was more interested in the response that he received from people and why people were so um, enraptured by him because mm -hmm. they were. Yeah, and this is what I really liked about your book in, in particular, because you're using Gerning sort of as a foil to highlight the people, the people who, who followed him. There are two, two people, right, at least, you know, the people who followed him to, and, and, and the people who were against him, people who feared him. So who were the people who, who came to him? Why did they embrace him? And um, did Gerning actually help them? <laughs> Yeah, it's it's that that's a that's a very that's a very central question of my book. Um, so, what kind of people came to see Groening was everybody. Rich people came to see Groening. People who were of modest means came to see Groening. Older people, younger people, men and women, um, all kinds of people. Uh, there were doctors who were convinced that he was, you know, he was going to change the face of medicine. There were. Um, there were, you know, clerics who thought that he was bringing, he was going to bring Germans back to God, which they, you know, very much wanted to happen. So there were all kinds of people who came to see Groening. The argument that I try to make in the book, and which of which I became convinced over time from reading about him and reading the sources about him, and uh, was that he in, it was indeed the case that he helped many people. What exactly he helped them from, or what exactly he helped them get past or what exactly he cured them of, if you will, that's it, that's that's more of a mystery. But but he helped a lot of people. And there are just endless attestations to this in the archives, people writing to say, you know, because Bruno Gröning finds himself in some legal hot water more than once um, over the course of the 1950s. 
Mm -hmm. And so there were people were, were asked to write, you know, witness statements about their experiences having met him and many, many, many people describe in quite a lot of detail how much he helped them. So that to me, as again, as an anthropologically minded person, I take seriously what people and tell me happened to them, right? Because yeah. they know better than anybody else. And I'm interested in their subjectivity, you know, in that situ in, in a situation like that. Um, right. And people came to groaning with all kinds of things, everything from migraine headaches to sciatica to, you know, um, a ringing in their ears to cancer to tuberculosis, all people with all kinds of, of different maladies came to groaning and he was able, it seems a lot of people who seem to have been cured by groaning were people who had been suffering from some kind of paralysis, people who had an arm that suddenly had gone numb and they couldn't use it anymore. People who had been walking and then needed to use a wheelchair because they couldn't get around on their legs anymore. I was, um, I was very fascinated by this. Why were people, why were a lot of people apparently suffering from some form of mysterious paralysis after the Second World War? I found that really interesting. And so um, those people with those kinds of maladies seem, many of them seem to have been helped by grooming. Okay. Exactly what that means, I don't know, but right. that's what I, that's what I try to show in the book. Yeah. So the second group of people were a little bit more skeptical, right? right. Those who, who those who opposed them. And, and, and as you say, the, the, some scientists were with them, but then some scientists were against them. Theologians were against them as well, church officials. Uh, at one point in the story, you, you, you quote Gurney as saying, I live with God, which no doubt had uh, was very uh, theologically troubling for, for many in the church. Catholic and, and, and Protestant church. Tell us a little bit about the people who opposed him and why did they oppose him? Yeah, I mean, of course, a lot of doctors opposed Groening because they thought of, they thought he was a charlatan. They were convinced that he had only one motivation and that that motivation must be somehow financial or in some other way to aggrandize himself. Um, there were also clerics who opposed him and people who opposed him who were not clerics, but who opposed him on religious grounds, because Groening would say things like, I can only cure good people. And then the point that people would immediately raise, as you put it, as you said, exactly, a theological point is if, you know, what does it mean for the idea, for example, of Christian redemption, if a person is, is, is bad beyond, um, beyond, beyond cure? beyond salvation, right? So people were very disturbed by some of the, d disturbed in theological terms by some of the things that Groening said. But then there were other ones. There were other clerics, really high, high ranking clerics, um, you know, very well-placed clerics who thought that he was, um, that he was helping people. And they said this, they said, I know people who have gone to see him and haven't received any help. And I know other people who have gone to him and received help. So, you know, there's sort of, there's a sort of non-committal quality sometimes, but also a sort of um, a sense that he's that he was serving some kind of powerful spiritual need that was not otherwise being met. You know, it's interesting because something that you mentioned in the book that that struck me is that um, a lot of times Gurney would just sit there and listen to the people's story. He would almost act like a therapist for 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 them, and then in, in, in that sense, he he helped people, um, but. I guess the, the question is, when you, whenever you, you meet uh, faith healers like this, what, what happens to their character? What happens to them as they gain more popularity? And what ultimately happened to Gurning? He, he died fairly young, is that right? Yeah. He died in his 50s, in his early 50s. Yeah. So what, what happened to his personality? What, did he ever become arrogant? Did he, did he start looking for money later on? Or was he always kind of opposed to that? Yeah, no, it's really interesting. So his, I, 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 I do show, I think in the book pretty clearly that he his I don't know if I would say his character, that's pretty deep, but his, his personality begins to shift somewhat in public at least um, over time. So he, one of the things that happens to him is that there's, from the beginning, there's a lot of people who want sort of a piece of the action. And there are people, there's a sort of group of people around him, 
uh, people who have varying motivations, let's say. And some of the, I think some of these people's motivations were quite sincere and some of their motivations were definitely not sincere. And at a certain point, Groening meets a couple called the Mecklebergs. And Otto Mecklenburg is the, you know, was a high ranking officer in the SS who somehow manages, like a lot of people like Otto Mecklenburg, to skate out of 1945, basically unscathed. Um, his wife's name was Renee, Renee Mecklenburg. And Groening meets this couple because Renee wants to, Renee has certain health issues she's dealing with and she wants to come and see Groening and then Otto Mecklenburg gets the idea that maybe, um, maybe there's some money to be made. There's some kind of bigger splashier thing that could happen with Groening than simply you know, standing in a muddy field somewhere um, with lots of people waiting for, for a cure. Um, and so he, he sort of hatches this idea that they will um, get a bunch of money together and then they're gonna found some clinics and Groening will sort, of, will sort of teach his methods to people in these clinics and these clinics will be overseen by doctors. I mean, there was a very elaborate sort of large um, plan um, and during this time when they're sort of trying essentially to get money together to start these clinics uh, and they sort of travel throughout Western Germany to do that, um, things do change. Uh, they're collecting large sums of money, which Groningen had never really taken money. I mean, people would sometimes leave him what, what, what would amount to tips or something based on what they could pay or they would you know, they, or they would leave a gift for him or something like that. But he, he was convinced that his power would be diminished if he took money. And so that was not a part of the thing for him. But Mecklenburg starts collecting money and, you know, the tax authorities get interested in the whole thing. And now Groening starts to get in some political hot water. But he also begins at a certain point to make, as the crowds, you know, as these huge crowds swell around him, he starts to make sort of some pretty grandiose statements about himself, about how if he yeah. wanted to, he could conjure a revolution among the German people. If he wanted to, he could, he, would, he could cure all of the people in a particular place, but he wouldn't do that because he doesn't want to heal bad people. He only wants to heal good yeah. people. So yeah, his, he, he changes as a character, I would say, um, over the course of the book. And then later on, um, towards the end of the book, we find out about someone who had met Groening in 1949, a young woman who had tuberculosis who died of tuberculosis. Um, and it was said when Groening was, Groening was put on trial essentially for, uh, yes. for something like manslaughter, um, no. for his relationship with this young woman and allegedly having told her to stop medical treatment. Um, I would say that by that time, he, his character had kind of changed one, once again and he was sort of begins to style himself as a sort of guru, as a sort of like, you know, a sort of um, a person who um, is particularly concerned about environmental issues and the overuse of pharmaceuticals in medicine. And so, so he, he has, he was a very mercurial character and he takes on many different guises over the course of the book. Yeah, great. I mean, um, besides Gurney, I mean, Gurney is not the, the only character. The other focus is almost like two parts to the book. The, the other focus is on uh, the, the scores of, of, of witch trials, witchcraft trials that took place across uh, the country in 19, from 1947 to 1965. And it's, it's really interesting because in this modern age, right, you're having witch trials. Um, tell us a little bit about that and how does that how does that background, the background in German folk medicine connected to the, the witchcraft that was going on during, during that time? Mm, okay, well, let's see, how should I start? Um, I feel like there were two questions in there. Do you think you could, you could take them apart a little bit for me? Sure, sure. So the, the first question would be, what were the witchcraft trials about? Yes, okay. And, how were they connected to more traditional German folk medicine? Yeah, well, okay, yes, of course. So the witchcraft trials, I should, I want to say this, I always try to say this immediately. These were not witchcraft trials where witches were put on trial and then had 
you know, had terrible things happen to them, like being burned at the stake. That is not yeah. what happened in post-war Germany. What happened in post-war Germany is that people who were accusing other people of being witches were themselves brought to court and tried for, among other things, defamation, but defamation being the most common one. So in fact, it's the reverse of what we think of when we think of the, the huge, scale, you know, the very large scale witch hunts of the, of the early modern period in Europe um, where, you know, witches were accused and then sometimes that snowballs into many more people being accused. This was the opposite of that, where people like some of the people that I describe in the book um, are being, you know, are getting accused by their neighbors of being witches, and then they take those people to court to make them stop saying those things, to stop defaming them. So that's that piece. The other piece is about, you know, the connection between folk medicine and, and, and witchcraft. And what I should explain here is that, and you're very right to point it out, is that witchcraft understood in this way, understood in the, in the, in the way that people understood it um, um, in, the, in the time that I'm writing about. Witchcraft was essentially using supernatural powers to bring harm to other people. One of the things that's interesting in the sort of tradition of German um, folk medicine is that people who, who were perceived to have powers to heal were often, let's say, had a kind of dual character or, or were perceived as having a dual character. In other words, the person who can make someone get better, shouldn't they also be able to make someone get worse if they want to, right? So there's, there was always this sort of duality and people who had that kind of ability to heal were always both revered and feared is the way I put it in the book. They can, they can do things that other people can't do. They can cure people of illness but they're dangerous because they have that power and they can use that power for whatever, for what to do whatever they want to do with it. So what's happening in the book, you know, when around the time of these witchcraft trials is that people are accusing, well, actually, I mean, just to get right down to the point, the one of the main characters in that part of the book is a guy named Valdemar Eberling, who himself was a healer, quite, you know, well-known one in the, in the local community in which he operated. And at a certain point, he, he doesn't say it in words, but he intimates to some people who are his clients that there might be a witch afoot. If a lot of people are getting sick all at the same time, and a lot of misfortune is befalling a lot of different people in the same community, and a tree just fell on somebody's house, and your crops are failing, and, 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 and. It was a part of the idiom of the sort of cultural idiom of some communities to start asking that question. Why is this happening? Why are we experiencing multiple misfortunes? And sometimes the answer to that question was maybe there's a witch. Maybe a witch is, is afflicting us. And so this guy that I was talking about a moment ago, Valdemar Eberling, who kind of accuses a few people. He doesn't, again, he doesn't do it in words. He intimates that maybe there's a witch afoot and he sort of gestures that it might be this person or it might be that person. He winds up in court, um, you know, accused of accusing people of witchcraft. And that case generated a huge file in the archives of fascinating material. So a lot of the sort of latter part of my book is concerns this, this case and some other cases like it. Yeah, at this point in your narrative, now correct me if I'm wrong, but at this point in your narrative, you introduce a uh, retired school teacher with a, a thesis, an argument that sounds very much like your own in, in, in some ways, uh, yeah. Johan Kruse. Mm -hmm. uh, who is Kruse and what was, he, what was he arguing? What was he saying in this context? So Kruse is just another one of these fascinating, amazing characters um, that I was so lucky to get acquainted with in, in my work. Um, Johann Kruse was a former school teacher. He had been an anti-Nazi. He was a social democrat. He, um, when I say anti-Nazi, I don't mean necessarily an outspoken one, but he was a person who was not, you know, um, he was moved around in his job several times from school to school because he showed, uh, let's say, limited enthusiasm for, for the Third Reich. Um, and even before the Second World War and bef before the Nazis came to power, he had been concerned about witchcraft accusations around the community that he came from, which was in the sort of far Northwestern part of 
of, of Germany. He was concerned about um, he was concerned about the fact that, again, as I was saying a moment ago, when people experienced multiple misfortunes, there were certain communities in which people would attribute that kind of thing, those multiple misfortunes, to witchcraft. And that usually meant then accusing one of their neighbors of witchcraft. And this had a terrible, a terrible social effect, as you might expect. I mean, in a community where people believe that witches can do harm to their neighbors, calling someone, someone a witch is serious. People could lose their friends, they could lose their income if they had a business that involved, you know, dealing with a lot of members of the community. They could become ostracized. And, and Cruz saw this happen. In fact, when he was a child, there was a, a case in which, uh, or a, a moment in which, you know, a, a neighbor lady came to his home to see his mother and said, you know, people are saying that I'm a witch and it's terrible. And this woman was distraught because of the social ostracization that came along with um, that kind of, of accusation. Cruza already in the 1920s kind of connected this behavior to the larger problem of anti-Semitism in Germany. And what he said was, it was very interesting. What he said was, you know, that um, in somewhat the same way that people in some communities in Germany will accuse their neighbors of being witches and attribute all kinds of misfortune to them. Similarly, in Germany, we have people who want to attribute Germany's loss of the First World War or other misfortunes that have fallen, befallen the nation, people want to attribute these to our Jewish neighbors. And he saw these as sort of parallel problems, which is very interesting because he was thinking this way already in the 1920s, long before the Nazis were a major political force in the country. He had already seen that there was some kind of parallel behavior afoot there. So um, then, you know, he, he, after the Second World War, there's a spate of accusations and he renews his um, sort of commitment to activism on behalf of those who've been accused. And he becomes kind of a um, national expert on this subject, which for most people living in most places was you know, quite um, unknown. I mean, it's not like people believed in witches everywhere in Germany. It's that there were communities where that was a kind of idiom of social conflict. And he becomes the guy who kind of explains this phenomenon to um, a culture in which um, not everyone understood exactly what it meant. Uh, and so he's just a fascinating guy all the way around, fascinating. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because it's interesting and just disturbing at the same time, despite all uh, this campaign, these efforts to uh, of denazification, you still have this mentality that's present. You still have this anti-Semitism or, or this just 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 general mentality that's still going on, but it's being being pushed onto other things. It's not just being pushed onto Jews now, although undoubtedly it still was, but it's been being pushed onto things like witches, right? Right. So. Um, Final question, wrapping up here, looking at what are you hoping is the, the big takeaway from, from the book? And in the conclusion, you very interestingly, you argue that, that the haunting of post-world Germany took on two different forms. You, you say there's a, there's a vertical form and then there's a, there's a horizontal one. Can you flesh that out for a little bit for, a little bit for us? Sure, yes, of course. Um, so when I, when I, you know, haunting is a kind of, a lot, of, a lot of social scientists and, and, hum, and humanists have become really interested in thinking about ghosts as real phenomena that people encounter in the world and what that means. And there's been some really, really interesting and thoughtful work about this, about you know, the ghosts in the United States, for example, of, of slavery, of Jim Crow, um, and the way that these kind of, um, un, the way that uh, white Americans have generally you know, kind of tended to push that history to the margins of consciousness to, I mean, even pretend that it doesn't affect what's happening to us now, what's happening to the country now. And what the people who have been writing about ghosts have been saying is that there are ways that the past haunts the present in a very real sense, um, despite our attempts to push 
parts of it that we don't like to the edges of consciousness, right? And so I was very taken by this very interesting way of thinking. And what I wanted to say by, you know, the sort of vertical versus horizontal forms of haunting, if you will, is on the one hand, when I thought about vertical, when I thought about the vertical axis, that was about people who are trying to find, you know, salvation after the Second World War, trying to find some kind of redemption in this catastrophic situation that they found themselves in, um, where such horrific violence had been done, such horrific crimes had been committed, and such tremendous unease kind of suffused society. And there are people who are looking for looking above vertically for some kind of salvation. Groening is a figure who represents a kind of um, not an answer to that problem, but but a kind of he's a figure who kind of s satisfies a certain need that people had for some kind of spiritual cleansing, I guess mm -hmm. would be one way of saying it. And it's but interesting. Horizontal. Yeah, go it's, ahead. Sorry. It's interesting because it was at the same time people looking for salvation or some some kind of deeper meaning and what, what happened is they're they're looking for for that, but they're not looking at, at the church for that. It's in many ways, it's anti-institutional, and it, it, is is that because many felt like the church had had failed them, uh, institutional religion had failed them to take seriously what has happened in, in in that moment in history. So one thing I would say is that I think you can have both things. I think people could be. I think you can have people who are still. I think this is true now. You can still have you, people can be involved in sort of in informal religious communities like churches, for example. And they can have a host of other, you know, beliefs and engagements and communities outside of that, of those kinds of arrangements. So I think both things can coexist. I don't think it necessarily meant if you went to Bruno Groening that you were rejecting, you know, if you will, institutional religion. It could have meant that, but not necessarily. I think it, it more meant that you were, might be rejecting institutional medicine, but that's, you know, that's a slightly different question from the one you're asking. But I would say that people, um, I think there were instances in which, I mean, I can think of one off the top of my head where there was a sense, I mean, you know, one of the things that I talk about in the book, which other historians have written about quite extensively are this just huge number of apparitions of the Virgin Mary that happened in Southern Germany and in the Catholic parts of Germany after the war. And one of the things that kind of erupts in these, in, there are moments where you know the, the, the institutional church does not like the fact that huge numbers of people are turning up to see these apparitions on an almost daily basis in some cases. And so the church begins to investigate what's happening and you know, in some cases takes local priests and moves them somewhere else to try to sort of tamp down this very unorthodox behavior. But in these, around these events, you have these, you have these arguments going on among lay ordinary Catholics. On the one hand, some people saying to be a good Catholic means that you do what the church says. And the church says, Virgin Mary is not showing up here, then she's not showing up. And other people say, why would I listen to the church when they were, you know, involved, so, you know, um, involved in what happened to such an extent that um, I don't trust them anymore. You know, that they didn't speak out against what happened vigorously, that they, in some cases, were cozy with Nazi leaders, right? So, so there are those moments, actually, in which there are these kind of, there's real friction and tension among people who sort of um, are, are, are following one or another of these sort of unorthodox groups and people who, um, who aren't, let's say. I don't know if that helps at all. I don't know if that was a very good answer. No, no, it, it, it does. And then and then the, the second part of the, the horizontal, what's the horizontal yeah. element exactly? The horizontal element is really about, is a, really a more social element, I thought. So hor the horizontal form of haunting that I describe in the book is are these instances like the witchcraft accusations where People are accusing each other of being witches in part. There were, there, were, there were many reasons, but in part, the kind of social churn that was created by 
the, the collapse of the Nazi regime, the introduction of, you know, of the allies into, into the mix, um, the feeling, the, the, the worry, the nagging latent fear that things one had done in the Third Reich would be exposed, mm. right? Crimes one had committed, property one had come by that was not one's to take, that somebody in your neighborhood might report this to somebody else and then you would be in trouble, right? And mm. that kind of unspoken fear among people created this kind of social churn and that's the horizontal piece, a kind of malaise that took hold in, in some communities. Um, and that's what, I, that's what I was trying to describe with the horizontal part. Yeah. Uh, extremely, extremely fascinating. And it, it, it does very much sound like a novel. I mean, facts stranger than fiction at times, but it, it, it's, it's our history. And, it's, uh, and, and based on that, you know, we, we have been asking all our uh, guests how their own disciplinary or methodological approaches contributes to that history, to understanding history. Uh, and obviously your book deals with a lot of archival evidence. And could you tell us a little bit uh, about the approach you took in the book, the sources you used in, in researching for the book? Yeah, it was a tough book to research in some ways. In other ways, um, I'm sure that there's more that I could have done. But you know, when you're when you're when you're a U.S. historian of of another part of the world, you can only go do research in the summers often because you're teaching during the rest of the year. And so, you know, I I found what I could find, but I found a lot. Um, the source, you know, most of my sources are archival sources. That's true, um, and they range from you know court records to police mm -hmm. reports and witness statements to sometimes photographic evidence to narrative sources like um, uh, people writing accounts of their experiences uh, with Bruno Groening. Um, it's a really wide range of things. Groening himself, you know, he, he had many followers and his followers, he still has followers now. I mean, there are websites in many, many languages. Really? Wow. You can look them okay. up. Oh, yes, yes, okay. yes. I actually don't know nearly enough about the dimensions of the sort of worldwide groaning um, interest. But I will tell you this, that a few years ago, a friend of mine said, did you know that a Bruno Groening organization in Asheville, North Carolina, which is a couple of hours east of where I live, wow. is meeting? And I was just amazed by this. So did you go? I didn't go. I really <laughs> should have gone. I really... <laughs> If, I, if it happens again, I will go. And I can't remember why I didn't that time. It, it might even have been the case that I found out about it just after it happened. Okay, okay. Because I'd love to speak with people about it. Um, no. But in any case, so Groening himself, because he had so many followers, people transcribed his speeches and they're available not just in German, but in English online. I mean, there's an amazing cache of that, of that material. There's also, I used a huge number of newspapers from the time, magazine clippings and, you know, so a lot of different kinds of sources. Right. Um, Did Gerning write anything? Did he write anything? Or was it the case where only his followers, his disciples wrote, wrote accounts and wrote, uh, kept a record of his teaching, so to speak? Yeah, it's really more the latter. I mean, he would give talks. He would give these kind of um, like spiritual message talks. And... Okay. And his followers would transcribe them. And it's clear that they were very meticulous in transcribing because every ellipse, every sort of repetition is, is captured. I mean, they were very careful. Um, I, Groening did not himself write anything, but he, well, he, you know, he would write little on the back of a birthday card or something. I've seen things like this where he wrote like a little note, but okay, like as far as okay. a sort of formal, like body of thought, he, that, no, he didn't do that. Okay. So uh, obviously very, very interesting topic and we want to know more and our listeners no doubt want to learn more. Can you, can you give us uh, maybe a couple of books or articles besides your own that we can link in the box below the video that when we, when we post the YouTube video, what other, what other work discusses uh, be, besides Deke and, and, and your own work? Who, who else talks about these things in uh, post World War II Germany? Well, for example, my colleague Michael O'Sullivan has written a really great book about Catholic women. Um, and 
he deals extensively with some of some of the Catholic miracles that took place after the Second World War. So that's just one example. Um, a lot of the material, you know, there isn't not a lot of historians have written about these subjects. A, a lot of people have written about a lot of folklorists have written mm. things about this kind of in the territory of, of this material and people who are sort of um, ethnographers have written about it. But historians, besides Michael, so it and sounds like we need to be more interdisciplinary. We need to talk to each other a little bit more. Yeah, I really think that's right. And I, you know, I'm I I could never have written this book without reading religious studies scholars, without reading anthropologists. I mean, without reading folklorists. That all those all those disciplines for me are are touchstones. I, I I have to go to them. I mean, my first book. I remember when when Death in Berlin was published, and I looked at the um, I looked for it in the library. And and I and I couldn't find it in the DDs. DD is where German history goes. Yeah. Um, and and I so I looked at my I looked in the in the in the you know online in the catalog and I realized that my book had been shelved in folklore, wow. which I was amazed by. So yeah. yeah, you know. So what is your next project? What are you working on right now? What's next for you? I'm working on so many different things that this is how I, this is kind of how I work though. It, and that's, it takes me a while to write things because I get so interested in going down so many different rabbit holes, which I, I think, you know, I love those historians who can just crank out books because they apparently don't get sidetracked the way that I do, but I get sidetracked. So I'm working on, I'm doing research about, I'm really interested in seeing how um, the effects of eugenic forced sterilization Oh. after after the third reich so for in the decades after 1945 what was that experience like for people and you know because um because people uh um appealed to the state for compensation for having been forcibly sterilized there's actually there are actually sources that tell us some things about people's uh people's experiences and i'm i'm very interested in that I kind of want to write a book about Hans Falada, the German novelist. Um, wonderful, amazing. I, I have my students read his book sometimes as, you know, like this is a, almost a better history of Weimar than any other history I've ever read. So let's just read this book. Um, I think about, I'm, you know, I, I'm also really interested in, oh, I don't know. I, I'm interested in so many different things. I'm also, I'm also writing a book about culture, about the history of culture in German uh, or, or history, sorry. I'm writing a book about culture in German history from roughly the 18th century to the present. So I don't know, I'm doing a bunch of different things. We'll see, I hope something, I hope I can get another book out of some of this somewhere. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you will. I mean, thank, thank you so much. The book is A Demon Haunted Land. Uh, Professor Black, thank you so much for, for joining us. It was a great discussion and we look forward to your next book or article or whatever it is, yes. Thank you so much. I was delighted to talk to you. Thank you.